Thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. My name is Alex Nichols, um, and I'm really excited today to have uh, my esteemed group of panelists joining uh, to really come and talk about what has been happening uh, with both the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial justice movement and how we can respond not only with our time and our effort and our interests, but also across our investment and granting uh, portfolios. Um, you know, we're going to go into what that exactly has meant and what it means, but I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce our panelists here briefly, and then they'll go on and describe themselves a little bit further. Uh, we have Ana Maria Argalagos, the president of Hispanics and Philanthropy, uh, Sophia Krieger Nelson, uh, a, a member of the Marin Community Foundation, and Emily Daniels, a strategic advisor to Brown Advisory. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Well, Thank so, you. I mean, just to give some context and some framing, uh, as was included in the description for this uh, panel, you know, one of the things that has really stuck out to me is uh, Impacts Asset Management recently posted an article, and they said, you know, all of these things that are happening, what does it mean? And the well, quote that stuck, stood out to me was, racial justice, environmental justice, and climate justice are not three things, but one. A sustainable future is as much about equality as it is about climate. Now, it's interesting. Oftentimes when we talk about ESG and impact investing, there will be more of a focus on one of those different issue areas or the other. But right now, I think where we really have seen is a confluence where the COVID crisis has really exacerbated a lot of the inequities that have also been brought to uh, light by the racial justice movement. Um, some of the statistics include that up to 90% of minority owned businesses have been left behind from the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, disproportionately, Black and Latinx business owners and individuals have been impacted not only by the health effects of COVID-19, but the economic effects as well. Um, now, in terms of how we respond to something like that, it can almost seem daunting. You almost feel oh, it's, it's overwhelming and it, it might seem like it's too much. Um, if you would do me a favor, as you introduce yourself briefly, maybe just give a brief introduction. And then if we could start out and each say, over the last six months, what has that meant to you as clients or individuals or organizations have come to you? How, you know, what has that looked like? Maybe, uh, Sophia, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Uh, my name is Sophia Craig Nelson. I'm Director of Philanthropic Planning at Marin Community Foundation. Uh, just by way of super quick intro, uh, MCF, we're the eighth largest community foundation in the country. Uh, we steward roughly $2.5 billion in philanthropic assets, and we work with individuals and families across the Bay Area for whom philanthropy is a really uh, big part of life. Um, so in terms of how we work, and then I'll get to, to you know, your question, uh, Alex, is that um, we operate strictly in a context of donated assets. So everything we do is philanthropy. Uh, traditionally, we've been doing mainly grants, uh, but um, a year and a half ago, we started an impact investing program in partnership with Impact Assets, I should say, uh, which has been a wonderful partner. Um, and But the way we approach it is that we see impact investing very much as an extension of philanthropy and just another tool through which our donors can direct you know, their assets to good causes. So what matters to us is really what our donors can do with the money and how they can quickly put it to work in the community and, and have maximum impact with their philanthropy. Um, so it doesn't matter to us if it's a grant, if it's like some sort of like hybrid innovative models or if it's impact investing. Um, in terms of what we've seen these last six months, um, you know, uh, yeah, well, the good news is that our donors are giving at really unprecedented levels. Uh, like I think there's been a real desire to meet the moment and uh, they've been laser focused these last six months on like wanting to direct support to where the greatest need is. Um, you know, in terms of, of metrics, uh, year on year, March, August, 2019, 2020, we've seen an increase of probably 50% of grants going out the door. So 
that's wonderful. Um, and, but in tandem with that, we've also actually seen a shift or a progression in the conversation where, you know, at first, you know, back in March where borders were closing and like everything was closing down and there was like that initial panic, um, the heart and mind of our donors were very much on the immediate relief. Like how could we help with food, rental assistance, masks, protective equipment. Um, and, 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 uh, and then slowly over the summer, uh, we saw, saw the conversation change. Um, and the main focus now is really on two challenges. Um, to build on what you said before, Alex, uh, you know, it's been very clear that the double whammy of pandemic and racial unrest after the merger of George Floyd showed that, you know, just how disproportionately affected communities of color are. Uh, and it really made the chasms and the fissures uh, within our social and political context glaringly apparent. Um, and with that, our donors have really had the desire to address the root causes and the systemic issues to, um, to this inequity. And in parallel, we've also seen, um, you know, a, a real concern that is that COVID is threatening the sustainability and the health of the nonprofit sector itself, its viability. Um, and our donors want to respond to this challenge um, by, you know, giving to the organizations that, they, that do the work that they're really passionate about and the issues that most concern them at greater levels. And, that, and we advise them to do that, to step up and support the nonprofit organizations and the sector, at, regardless of uh, issue area, whether it be education, arts, youth development, climate change, health. So we're, we're definitely seeing the, the conversation sort of like crystallize around those two um, uh, different uh, issues. Great, thank you, Sophia. Absolutely. Uh, Emily, from, uh, from a strategic advisor and wealth management and asset management um, side of things, First of all, again, we'd love if you could introduce yourself, but can you explain what that has kind of looked like for you and your clients? Absolutely. So again, um, Emily Daniels, and I'm a strategic advisor with Brown Advisory. We are an investment management firm, started in Baltimore a little over 20 years ago, uh, came out of Alex Brown, uh, the investment bank. We have about $86 billion of assets under management split between our institutional side of the house, which actually runs investment strategies, mutual funds, private equity funds, uh, separately managed accounts, and the private client endowments and foundation side of the house, which is your traditional uh, family and um, organizational portfolio management function. Um, what we've been seeing uh, over the past six months, I'll say, is, is threefold. Uh, from the business itself, we have really accelerated our efforts in diverse hiring for the firm at all levels. Um, it's something that we've been talking about already uh, before this year, but we have really put in a lot more pushes and a lot more very tactical act, um, activities uh, to increase our diverse hiring at the top of the house all the way through uh, summer interns. Um, as those of you on the call in financial services know, that's a tough thing to do uh, in our industry, but we are really dedicated to doing that. Um, on the institutional side of the house, uh, we have had many sustainable investing strategies on our platform for many years. Um, and I'll say that we have been talking more about expanding that offering due to increased uh, demand, both from individual investors and institutional investors. Um, and, and thinking about um, more thematic ways of doing that beyond the basic um, ESG version of sustainable investing and starting to target actual um, uh, impact areas for some of those investments. I, as a strategic advisor, um, sit on the private client endowments and foundation side. And my role in talking to clients is uh, that traditional wealth management function, wealth planning function. Uh, so I'm not the investment manager. I'm really the person who's helping them put some context around their financial lives. Uh, so we do all sorts of financial planning up through the most sophisticated philanthropic 
and wealth transfer planning uh, and business exit planning for clients. And so typically in the past, um, it is my it has been my job to help clients think about what their goals are, uh, what their family legacy looks like. But I'll say that in the past, over the past 20 years, most of those conversations, especially around philanthropy, uh, were really about tax saving strategies. Um, our clients were not coming looking to me to help them think about what actual impact they wanted to make. They were looking to me to help them figure out how to save on income taxes and estate taxes. Over the past six months, um, I will say that we've not necessarily had clients doing more uh, philanthropic structure setup. So I've not seen clients putting more into their foundations or more into their donor advised funds. I've been seeing them push more dollars back out out the other side, uh, which is kind of what Sophia was saying. We're seeing more dollars actually go out into organizations that will use those for change. Um, and we're also, for the first time, in my role, again, as a tax technician, having clients come to me and say, you know, I, I've just never really thought about how to decide where to give the money. That wasn't part of the conversation at the front. And so that is forcing me and my colleagues uh, to build more relationships with the Sophia's and the Anna Maria's in the world because our clients are asking us, where where should these dollars go? I need to know what organizations to look at. I need to, to think about what impactful giving means. Um, and we're still building our skill set on that in-house. Um, and then one final thing is that we do have an endowment and foundations practice, but that is managing money for endowments and foundations. And I'll say that um, those organizations are starting to think even more about mission-related investing. Um, you know, not new, not a new thing at all. I just think that this year has created a bit more urgency for those clients um, in aligning their endowment portfolios, their savings portfolios with their mission. Great. That's thank, thank you very much. And you know, Anna Marie, uh, to that point of as the money is going out, if you wouldn't mind, of course, describing you and your organization, but then also what has that meant in terms of the inbound? When people are coming to you, are they looking for an answer? Are they looking to, you know, how does that process work? Thank you, Alex. It's really great to be here and to be with Sophia and with Emily. It's just um, a great platform. Um, HIP is very different in that, we're a philanthropic supporting organization and we're also a public grant making charity. We've been around for 38 years. I've been the president and CEO for two and a half of those years. And so you can see that we've been shift changing, <coughs> excuse me, throughout the, um, our time. So our work as a philanthropic supporting organization, we're connecting, we're convening, we're informing, educating, advocating, and Really through the first half of our existence, we were doing that for a range of foundations, um, whether they be community foundations or uh, family foundations, <coughs> private foundations. Um, we also now have been working more and more with organizations like Emily's where we're working with donors, high net worth individuals um, and, and, and others that want to really understand how, what is their role and how can they work with uh, the Latino community, which is growing, as you all probably already know, we are almost 20% of the population now. And I think by 2050, we will be 30% of the population. So it's an important um, and a very young population. So it's important to work with the community. Our work as a public grant making charity looks more like an intermediary. As such, we're sourcing, also advising, aggregating and leveraging dollars. <coughs> Excuse me. Part of our work is about getting more and better resources on the ground. And as the only Latino intermediary that's working across the hemisphere, because we work in the US and Puerto Rico, Mexico, Central South America, we can do that in ways that we address problems in a holistic way, um, because problems really like health, for example, don't end uh, concretely at the border. They do cross borders. Um, our work, 
as democrat our north star is democratizing philanthropy and we've touched on that it's the notion that regular people folks like us are also philanthropists. Even if you're not writing the $10 million checks, if you're writing the $10 check, if you're doing it through a crowdfunding platform uh, or other different pathways that we're helping to create, that also counts. And so how do we make sure that that's easy and accessible to folks and that they're able to grow as their finances grow? Uh, with regards to COVID, Alex, we've um, put out between April and the end of October, it'll be $10 million in COVID relief. And that's double what we usually do in a year. So yes, I've seen an incredible amount of generosity, both from individuals and also from foundations and corporations, 3 million of the dollars that we, <coughs> that we are putting out is from, the, from Google. And that's specifically for the Power Up Fund to help small businesses, entrepreneurs, survive you know this um, horrible pandemic already we've seen that one third of our latino businesses have already closed and we're trying to figure out how we can help them those that are still surviving survive through what's going on we want to do this because we remember the 2008 recession we know that when the country started stabilizing in 2010 it took our communities, people of color an extra two years and those were those are two years lost and so for people to be able to be uh, givers and um, philanthropists in their own way, we, they also have to have some kind of built up wealth. And through the power of fund, it's one of the tools that we have. It's, an, uh, it's a return seeking, uh, as an impact investing fund, it's a return seeking <coughs> excuse me, uh, fund. And um, we feel that that's one tool. I think the takeaway I want you to take um, from this conversation is that a COVID, the pandemic, um, the economic um, situation that we're in, the unrest, it requires us to double down on creativity and nimbleness and, and not doing the same thing. At HIP, we're doing that. If you would have told me a year and a half ago when I first started that I'd be investing in businesses, I'd be like, what? No, we're about, we're, uh, you know, it's about charity. It's about, you know, we're, we invest in nonprofits and essential, uh, you know, organ frontline organizations. So we're investing in businesses and we're doing, not a silver bullet of just grants, but really looking at your whole portfolio of tools. And that includes grants and it includes investments. Um, and that way I think we can get out of this, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. Absolutely, thank you for that. And, you know, to your point, Ana Marie, one of the things that we have really seen is what does it look like to do things creatively? Just, you know, at Impact Assets, just as a, brief introduction for us. We're a donor advised fund that focuses on not only helping people grant their money out, but invest it for positive impact. So, you know, in the first half of the year, we gave out 3.5 times the number of grants that we typically give. Uh, we, you know, our clients though have also said, what does it look like to not only grant for causes, but to how do we invest into these things? So. $160 million have been deployed to frontline healthcare needs, uh, 25 million to high impact social enterprises that might've been you know, in danger of closing if they didn't get support and another 29 million to underserved businesses and individuals. So these, these are clients saying, I wanna use philanthropic dollars to invest in these types of organizations to make sure that they succeed. Um, and that brings me to the next point is that if somebody does want to come and get involved, uh, we want to really talk about what it would look like across asset classes. And this is where I'm not only gonna look to our panel, but to uh, our attendees as well. So I already see that Rick was asking about community development financial institutions. I'm gonna go over with the panelists some different ways that we have seen uh, individuals and organizations deploy capital to these uh, to these causes, but by all means, please add in, in the chat, you know, different groups or funds, you know, we are learning here just as much as, you know, we are sharing. So that would be fantastic. Um, to Rick's point, you know, Calvert Impact Capital is an organization that has been around for many years, but has really right now taken the cause of how do we support these, these communities and been, 
the infrastructure, if you will, of supporting the different funds that are happening. So they've done a fantastic job of working with different communities to say, how do we invest in our community going forward? Uh, another group is called C-Note, um, Vamos Ventures. There are multiple different community development financial institutions or uh, feeding organizations like Calvert uh, Impact Capital that are doing a great job. Um, but you know, outside of that, uh, panelists, you know, would you, if you wouldn't mind sharing either what your organization itself is doing, or um, other organizations that you have come across that are have been really strong models. You know, I think CDFIs are fantastic in the Latino community. We have an umbrella organization that's called NALCAB, National Association of Latino Community Asset Builders, and it's an umbrella of the CDFIs. At HIP, we're partnering with a lot of them. Our work in, in, um, in um, Texas is with the LIFT Fund, for example. In a place like Puerto Rico, we don't have CDFIs. So we work with the CDCs and with the community banks. And a lot of them are hoping to be um, CDFIs. In inclusive action in Los Angeles, we're working with them. Um, but I think that that's an important place to start. But I think, as I said before, don't just put all of your eggs in the one basket. As much of a fan as I am of CDFIs, I used to work at HUD, right? So they, they're our partners. Um, uh, you remember that CDFIs are also financial institutions. And so they are restricted in, in their flexibility and they have criteria to meet. So I would do an assortment of working with CDCs, CDFIs. We also work with accelerators, incubators, other types of organizations that can also take risks because what's happening in the current economy is there's not a lot of risk taking. So there's a lot of organizations and Bridgespan did this um, report with Echoing Green of uh, foundations and donors um, are being very generous, but they're investing in those that have attributable track record that we can, you know, we can see. And what happens? Uh, people of color are left behind and are not the ones. And this is not just my anecdotal observation. This is tracked and there's evidence for are not getting the dollars. And so we need to take some kind of risk um, in terms of our philanthropic investments because we, we don't do that with the philanthropic investments. The government definitely isn't going to do it. Um, at Brown, you know, I mentioned our socially responsible um, mutual funds. Those are really public companies, so that's not really what we're talking about here. Uh, on the private company side, um, last year, so this is pre-COVID, pre-craziness of 2020, we set up two Opportunity Zone funds in partnership with a local um, social entrepreneurship uh, firm. We had one in Baltimore and one in Austin, Texas, and both of those projects uh, were focused around uh, real estate uh, redevelopment in underserved communities. So that's one thing that we were doing. And then we also have internally a, an embedded venture capital firm slash network. Uh, that itself is not generally just looking for socially responsible investing, impact investing, but they do have a subset of their um, network that does look to invest very specifically in socially um, innovative companies. Um, and so they, they do several things within that network. Um, it is sourcing companies that are doing social good. It is, it is uh, funding companies, regardless of what they do, but that are led by underrepresented minorities uh, in the business community. It is encouraging all the businesses that they invest in to think about diversity within their workforce. So they're, they're doing that work on every level of working with these companies that we engage with. And I'll say that that piece is also happening within the mutual funds in terms of not just looking at the top of the house, but also pushing out into those organizations and figuring out what we can be doing to encourage them to be better citizens. Right. Um, so uh, 
I, you know, I'd add to that that at MCF, we, we sort of start with the issue and we, we let sort of a donor come to us and tell us what they're interested in and then we help them, you know, have that impact. Uh, and, and that can be through, you know, grants, it can be through investments, it can be through other, you know, innovative models. So um, on the CDF5, for instance, yes, we have had a number of clients that wanted to help uh, small businesses and especially the ones that did not qualify for the PPP and the ones that were left behind. So um, we've had some clients address it through grants. You know, I, I've seen some sig significant grants go through to Opportunity Fund. Um, another one that's come up a lot is the, um, let me see, L-I-F-F, -F, what does it stand for again? It's uh, Low Income Finance Fund, I believe, uh, also have committed, they've committed like five billion in the next few years to helping communities of color. Um, but we've also seen, um, uh, you know, uh, more like you were talking about the importance of doing of doing things more in a, in a more risky way. Uh, we've also actually seen clients that wanted to make sure that VC um, uh, that wanted to make sure that like women entrepreneurs like in the VC space of color got, uh, you know, the funding that they typically don't get. So we've actually seen a fair amount of pretty good size um, custom deals go through in a first fund. So no track record whatsoever called How Women Lead. Fund one. Uh, the, the interesting thing about this is it's a VC fund that is investing in women of color, but it's actually also run by women of color. Um, we definitely have a lot of, of donor interest in C Note that Alex men mentioned as well. And, you know, they have a, you know, that their wisdom fund focuses on small business owners, but like women of color in particular. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're open to sort of, you know, facilitating uh, money going to the, 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 the populations that our clients want to help in a variety of ways. Um, and it can be many different issues. So uh, I, I saw that uh, in the chat that uh, Katerina Schwab from NPX Advisors is on, the, is on the call. And I was just going to say that we actually have some clients that have supported uh, some of the work they do, which is, um, you know, a very interesting model that blends uh, investments with uh, grants as well, and like a very interesting uh, place-based approach. Uh, we have some clients that are uh, big supporters of their work, um, and and it's really it's it's work that addresses, I think, the viability of the nonprofit sector. You know, it's like how can a nonprofit actually raise assets uh, in in the long in the short to in the medium to long term. Um, and then I'd say that we sometimes also you know addressing root causes can also be looking at maybe voter registration or voter engagement. And we've seen a lot of interest from our donors um, to that. And it can be, you know, through regular grants or it can be in a much more risk-taking way. Um, on the more risky side of things, we have a client that made like the largest custom deal to date, you know, in partnership with Impact Assets to a company uh, it's an LLC that is sort of an online gamified platform that really tries to get younger people to uh, register and engage in, in the political discourse. So I think we've seen, you know, everything from classic grants to, you know, the, the private uh, direct investments in companies, operating companies. That's fantastic. And, you know, uh, in hearing you talk about that, about how there's so much more that needs to be dealt with. Um, there's a, well, I was gonna say it's a quote, but it was actually a tweet. So I don't, I don't think that's the, <laughs> but uh, Melissa Bradley from 1863 Ventures posted something the other day that really stuck out to me. Um, to my friends investing in black business, remember COVID exacerbated our challenges, not caused them. If and when the pandemic goes away, racism will still exist. Use not just your money, but your voice and clout to remove the structural barriers to our success. Um, Anna Marie, if you wouldn't mind sharing, when you think about those structural barriers, what type of capital and in what way is Hispanics and philanthropy advocating removing those structural barriers through investing? Or do you think it's not just investing? Well, like what, what is, uh, how, how is the Power Up Fund approaching this? Thank you. And Jill, I see that Jill Johnson also sent a, a note, a question, which is related to this. Um, we know that over the past 10 years, 
Latino businesses were growing 34%. And that's as compared to white, 1% for the white counterparts. And so they were doing this even though there was huge disinvestment <coughs> despite the challenge, they were growing. And um, what we were trying to do before the pandemic was figure out how to close that gap, given that, again, uh, foundations are only investing 1%, uh, government is not investing. I mean, with the PPP dollars, um, I think only 9% of Latino businesses were able to access that. And then we saw the same um, disinvestment in venture capital. And um, I think the number is 2% uh, back in 2016 that uh, black and brown entrepreneurs combined were able to access those dollars. So what we were trying to do is close that gap. And that includes a broad, it includes like, for example, getting fund managers that are, uh, people of color, they're not enough fund managers. It includes um, demystifying that uh, investing in our communities is risky. Um, it's not, uh, the numbers show that it's not, but um, there's this, this mentality that it is. And so the Power Up Fund was meant to start closing those gaps in terms of where do people get their money to get started. And before COVID, it was gonna be all return seeking $16 million fund, uh, which Impact Assets is holding. And um, $1 for every Latino, Latina that's living on the mainland of the US. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, because of COVID, we restructured what the Power Up Fund is looking like. As I mentioned, um, now $10 million, the first 10 million is for cash assistance um, in cities across the country, uh, trying to, since PPP was not there for them, uh, offering that cash assistance and technical assistance too, because not just throwing dollars at the, at the situation, we need technical assistance. So we have organizations like the Lift Fund, like Eureka, uh, like Alapara, um, that are providing wraparound technical assistance to our entrepreneurs to make sure that they get through this. Uh, those that did receive the uh, PPP loans right now, we're very invested in making sure that those loans get forgiven because that's not a done deal either. But uh, the next 50 million that we're launching now is for the return seeking impact investing because we have to remember that there are also some entrepreneurs that are starting their businesses now. Uh, they're, they're seeing a gap in the, and so not all of them are um, failing. There are some that we're able to support now and that they have a good, if, if supported, they have a reason to, they have new audiences and new clients. So what I would say is that we need to do both the investments and the grants. It's, um, it takes both. Great. No, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, Emily, when you deal with this and, you, you know, you're looking at dealing with both, maybe one, one of the things, if you wouldn't mind, we could talk about is, I, you know, we don't want to use the term pushback because maybe we should, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that. But, you know, what would you say have been maybe, are there any challenges that you come across either explaining this to the clients or you know looking at what is available out there have you come to any anything that's made this either difficult or you'd like to see improve over time yeah i think um in the early days of the concept of impact investing um, we would get a lot of pushback from portfolio managers because their job is to drive returns and so it is convincing portfolio managers that clients would indeed be interested in investing in something that does not necessarily have a market rate of return. That's the first hurdle. Um, I think the second hurdle is, you know, not something unique to, to Brown and something I think we've gotten past at this point. Um, and it's something that you see in any for-profit business. Um, it's a question of whether or not having conversations like this is even part of our business model. Why are, why are we having conversations about social impact? We are here to you know, help our clients save for retirement and things like that. And so thinking about how these issues um, should be incorporated into the company's DNA into how we do things, I think is an important cultural shift that 
all firms are going to have to think through, uh, for-profit firms are going to have to think through in order to move forward on this. Um, I think our clients don't give us a whole lot of pushback. Our clients are waiting for us to raise this issue with them. I just think that often um, wealth managers just don't know how to start that conversation just because we're not trained in that. We are trained in economics. We are trained in tax. We are trained in financial modeling, but this is softer. Um, and sometimes we don't think it's in our wheelhouse uh, to, to have those conversations with clients. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry, Anne-Marie. Well, you were talking about pushback. Um, pushback is very genteel and gracious and <laughs> From my perspective, I very seldom see a, no, that doesn't make sense. I often say, that's a good point, later, later, later. So it's always later, but we don't have any more laters to pull out of our pockets. I think that the urgency of the moment requires now. Well, and, you know, in that sense, Sophia, one of the things that I think you really work with clients on is maybe they don't know what to do. So when somebody comes to you to that point, you know, what does that conversation look like? You know, or where they express, where have they said, maybe this is challenging? So, uh, yes, so, so that is very much our model. Um, clients that come to NTF come to us because they want that engagement and they want philanthropic advice. So, um, I mean, it starts from the very beginning. They'll have a dedicated philanthropic advisor. And I should say right away that that's not me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm speaking at a very high level about like what this work looks like. But um, a client will come with us and we'll start with an onboarding and a very, very deep discovery conversation to understand what the client is looking to achieve. So we're, we're very donor driven in the sense that we don't have issue areas or, or, or things that we push in terms of um, what we think they should be interested in. We hear what they want to do and then we help them achieve it by uh, curating um, opportunities and, and, you know, educating and uh, showing them, you know, doing due diligence on the types of organizations that we think they might want to, um, you know, uh, give or invest uh, in. Um, so I'd say it's very much, uh, it starts with what a client wants to achieve. And then we take it from sort of, you know, all the way from the mission statement to a giving plan to the tactical implementation. Um, I would say that the, there's always, you know, the, the challenges slash opportunities, because they're both in moments like this, is that this is a moment for philanthropy to step up. And I think for the most part that it, this is definitely what our clients want from us. They are engaged. They want our help. Um, there's, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the greatest challenge, I think, of backdrop is that there's, this is a moment of reckoning as well. Uh, you know, 2020 has prompted a lot of soul searching and the philanthropic sector, I think, as a whole and individual funders like MCF, we've been forced to maybe re-examine in a way we never quite did before the role we want to play in addressing root causes of inequity and how we may actually be able to do things differently and better. And I think part of that is recognizing some tensions, you know, that exist. I mean, you know, I can just say like Marin County is unfortunately, you know, a very segregated community. I mean, how can we with authenticity actually like lead, a, you know, lead change. And in the same way, respect that it has, you know, it has to be our donors that want to do this work. Um, you know, we, a lot of us on the team, uh, you know, we probably, we probably have a more diverse team than our client base. You know, we have clients that have led, led long life of privilege and, uh, you know, they are high net worth. So, so we're trying to find ways to meet the moment, to turn towards action and toward choices that reflect that we think, you know, uh, yeah, that, that we want to do. Um, and in the same time, like make maybe MCF as comfortable as possible to uh, clients of color. So I think a lot of that work is not something you do very quickly. And at MCF, we are really looking inwards to our own values. And we've engaged on very, very deep DEI work. Um, so we've, we'd already, we already had a DEI committee before COVID hit, but I think that there's a sense of urgency from everybody that works at MCF to actually really take take this to new levels. And we're, 
you know, we're, we're, we're starting with ourselves <laughs> and then thinking like this is, is challenging, it's difficult, but it's also an opportunity to really reinvent ourselves as funders and be more relevant and more impactful than ever before as we go forward. Thank you for that, Sophia. I really appreciate sure. you uh, sharing about that because, mm -hmm. you know, that really, it can be one of the things that, you know, when you're, when somebody comes to you and they say, how can I make a change? How can I have impact? You also mm -hmm. have to evaluate yourselves and how you're doing business. Um, I know at Impact Assets, when our clients come to us, we, we have over 1,200 clients. And with that, that means we have 1,200 sometimes views of how they would like to see change happen. Um, some view it as I want to use my philanthropic dollars and just make for granting. Um, others might say, I want to get deeply involved in direct investments into early stage companies. And so being able to not just have a single prescriptive way of saying, if you want to deal with uh, the COVID response or racial justice, here's how it's done, full stop you know, I think is something that isn't going to really be feasible. And so in that sense, you know, and again, I brought this up earlier, figuring out what people can do, I, I, you know, in this, in the case of just, you know, talking about private equity, um, Illumin Capital recently um, closed uh, their round, and they are a private equity firm that is focused on not only uh, investing into organizations, but educating them on what it looks like to be more mindful about um, racial inclusiveness and diversity. Um, and so they've done an amazing job. Uh, and so several of our clients have said they want to get involved. Um, we have other clients, though, that, you know, investing in a private equity fund is not necessarily something that they either have the assets to dedicate to or have the experience of doing that. So um, yeah, I definitely know what you mean when we talk about the difficulty and the tensions of trying to respond to all of those. Um, we're gonna be getting to questions actually in two minutes now. So as I said previously, please, you know, by all means uh, share. But, um, you know, before we got going, you know, one of the things that I was curious to hear about is, you know, when clients do get engaged, what does it look like to take them to the next level? Or, you know, what is something, so Ana Marie, if somebody came to you and they said, we want to get started, um, how do you kind of walk them through that process? Is it more so, um, well, listen, you know, here's, here's how we do things, or, you know, what does it look like at uh, Hispanics and Philanthropy? There's a lot of, of engagement and education because they often just say, we don't wanna sit at the sidelines during this urgent moment, we wanna do something. And so we try and look in balance between the immediate needs. For example, in April, we were putting out um, funds to address farm workers, right? The health and safety of farm workers who are picking our food and who's paying, paying attention to them, essential workers, um, and so the immediate relief after Hurricane Maria right now, uh, you know, with the fires right now, you need to balance that. But you also have to talk to funders about the longer term systems change. And Safia talked a little bit about this. If we're putting all of our dollars into just right now and we're not looking into um, solving for how do we get in this place, as Melissa Bradley's quote says, this is just all exacerbating what was already there, but we weren't seeing. So we work with, with donors so that they can understand that they need to put dollars into both of them. And we've been by far very successful. Although there are still a lot of donors that say, just put all of the money into the immediate relief and later on everything will get sorted. But we work really hard to do the donor education upfront. And it's something that is all year round. It's not just one time of the year. I, I don't think it can be a one-off. Um, because I don't think that that works with donors. But in the end, it's, um, you have to reach both the heart and the mind. Um, one alone, I don't think is successful. And you have to have good partners like you guys at Impact Assets, Alex. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I, <laughs> I got a little red, but thank, yeah, but thank you, that's great. Um, you know, we have about 15 minutes left and I wanted to open up to some questions and 
Um, as they come in, you know, maybe we'll wait a couple of uh, a minute or two, but then, you know, I, I'm just, trust me, they were, you know, on our pre-call, we had to cut ourselves short. We had a lot, uh, a lot to cover, but it would be great to hear if anybody has anything specific that they would like to cover. I'm just looking at the chat log here. There's lots of great resources on the chat log. There are some fantastic resources here. Um, you know, and as we're waiting for those to come in, um, I think we've covered uh, most of the things, but please let me know if there's something that I missed. I'm trying to do uh, double duty here a little bit. Um, you know, one thing that I have um, somewhat seen, and we may have touched on it already, um, but, you know, when a client, one thing that we have seen is that in certain instances, we have seen firms uh, say something along the lines of, and I won't name them, but you know, they said, "Oh, yeah, COVID. We we dealt with that. We raised some money. You know, we had a fund. It's over." Um, maybe if you wouldn't mind, panelists, sharing what we're thinking. You know, what does a? How do you keep people engaged? Know that this is an ongoing issue, but b. What might the future look like in terms of the next steps of <coughs> responding, just so that people don't say, I made a grant to the emergency fund? Oops, I'm off, I'm off mute, so I'll talk. Um, you need to talk, uh, think about both the relief and the recovery. Um, as someone that's done a lot of the disaster response um, and man made disasters like the economy and social unrest are also. Um, disasters as well, but think about that, that the recovery is a lot longer and more complicated and needs a lot of people at the table. And so what are the partners that you're going to bring in to help fill in the gaps? Because I don't know any organization that can do it all. Um, as great, you know, as, as great as we all are, we need to bring in others. And so being, um, knowledgeable about developing that landscape analysis and figuring out what you know the recovery that to me that's important and needs to be taken into consideration yeah i and i would agree exactly completely with that i think that there's always going to be a need for addressing something very urgent like well, we know the the fires right now you know the uh, you know, there, there was a need for food and rental assistance, it's still there. But I think the important thing is to take that conversation and actually, uh, you know, keep it current. And I think that we have seen our clients have a willingness to think about, well, what does this well look like in the medium to long term? We know this, this is not something, this is not a box that's just checked. And I think that the one, like those are our clients that are really interested in doing, you know, addressing the systemic issues um, of, um, you know of of of, of what this co that what what this pen double pandemic of social unrest and uh, you know COVID has shown is that there are some things that are like there are deep fissures that we need to address and some root causes and I think we all understand that that's going to take quite a while and then again to come back to the other issue about like what does the nonprofit sector look like in general like how can we make sure that those those uh, organizations that do things around the arts or education are not defunded because everybody's money is going to the very immediate needs. So I think like it's having those conversations and then, and really also I think forging deep partnerships, you know, and thinking of new and innovative ways we can all work together. Uh, there's a, you know. there's a lag, Safia, and you probably oh. know this because budgets for nonprofits were determined usually last year by foundations that budgeted for them last year. And so many nonprofits mm -hmm. are okay K and or they might they're limping along right now, but the real moment of crisis is going to be 2021 because budgets for 2021 are being done now, and those are the ones that are being retrenched on or reallocated. I mean, I saw numbers. We have something called LatinxFunders.org. I'll put it on the chat, um, which has been tracking um, funding from 2013 to 2017. And I just talked to an LA Times. Um, reporter yesterday, she's like, how come funding has gone from arts and culture, which you mentioned, from uh, 45 million in you know, 2013 to only 13 million in 2017, right? In, in this retrenching and this reallocating. And um, I'm scared about what that's gonna look like in 
next year. And so I think that our role as advising donors uh, where to put their money is even more important in this environment. Mm -hmm. And emphasize yeah. the fact that there is no such thing as bad philanthropy. Like every, like everybody has need right now and go with where your passions are and just give more and maybe in a slightly more unrestricted way as well. That's Sorry, really, Emily. I've never heard right. that. That's, that's really good. <laughs> Um, I wanted to follow up on both of those points, actually, um, both how do you keep people engaged and how do you keep philanthropic dollars from being sucked away from other areas? Um, for my clients, I approach this conversation the same way as I approach their personal planning conversation. What do you want the outcome of this deployment of dollars to be? And then we can back into what you need to do to get there. If really all you want to do is make sure that people can pay rent for those next six months, maybe that is just a one-time thing and I've given to the fund and I'm done. If you want to revamp the healthcare system, well, you need to know at the front end of us coming up with a plan that that's not going to be a one and done type of thing. We're going to be looking at a decade's worth of you funding it. So starting with the end in mind is how we approach those conversations. Um, and on the other piece that we were just talking about, in addition to my work at Brown Advisory, I'm on the board for World Food Program USA, and we work to support the United Nations World Food Program. Um, and we were actually very happy to have done a good job at fundraising over the past six months because we did have a campaign that was centered around COVID. And I think um, for a lot of donors, the trick, not I don't want to say the trick, the goal is to make sure that they understand how interrelated all of these things are to one another um, and that you can give to a variety of types of organizations and still help a particular cause. Um, and I think we found that to be very helpful at World Food Program in encouraging donors to keep donating to us. Great, thank you. And Emily, as we were talking, there was a question for you. Are you seeing top-down change helping wealth managers initiate the values and portfolio alignment conversations? Or is that something that you, know, you are bringing to this conversation yourself? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, I think a lot of those conversations are had because portfolio managers recognize that clients increasingly expect those conversations to happen and expect for us to be putting them in diverse, um, in funds that, are, that have diverse managers and things like that. Um, but I'll say that also Brown in particular is very much committed to increasing our own diversity because we feel that we really don't have the moral authority to, in, to encourage our clients to invest in ESG funds if we ourselves don't fit the criteria that we would need to include a company in one of our funds, right? So it is um, both a sense of what, what do we want our firm to look like from the top down, and it is also a response to what we know clients today and in the future will ask us for. So it's a little bit of both. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, you know, I would say just real quick as well, one, uh, you know, be, I'm on the board of a group called Black Girl Ventures, and um, one of the things that the, her, the founder Shelley Bell has said is that, you know, she doesn't have time for necessarily people to figure out the exact best way to have the conversation, or you know, oh, we need to make sure that everything is completely filled, you know, done properly. She uh, she's a big fan of people saying, "Let's get started." So she says come join one of our pitch competitions where we support black female ventures. Join in, watch it next time, give a few dollars. It, it can be an education that happens, but you have to affirmatively just jump in. And I think it can, in certain instances, seem daunting, but I think it's important that we all do this work. Um, and, you know, so 
in that instance, you know, where you were saying, how do you know, where does this conversation start? Um, I just think, you know, at Impact Assets, when our clients come to us, whatever their interests might be, you know, it, we just ask them to get that process started, whether it's, you know, there's uh, a group called Impact Shares. They have an ETF where they actually worked with an NAACP to figure out what are the best com public companies for that support the African American community. Um, they invest in that in the, into those companies, and then a certain percentage of the proceeds go to support the NAACP. Um, you know, these are funds on the public side where maybe it's not a direct investment into an early stage enterprise, which is amazingly important, but it's a starting place to say, you know, I'm getting involved. Um, you know, as we're wrapping up, we have about three minutes. I'd love to just hear from each of the panelists, just, you know, as a final thought, what is something you would want people to take away from this conversation? Or what is something as they go and they talk to other people, maybe they need to keep in mind? I can start if that's okay. So I'll just say, actually building on what you just said, uh, Alex, I think, you know, um, we wanna be thoughtful, but we also wanna actually meet the moment. Uh, and I think let's not make the perfect be the enemy of the good. So I would sort of be, you know, there's so many, so many, so much work that needs to be done. There is no such thing as bad philanthropy. All causes are kind of interconnected when you think about it. So I would say, you know, just like, let's not sit on the sidelines. I love where you took us, Alex, as well, and underscoring Safia, which is just get started, be curious and open minded, and listen more than you talk. Um, that's hard. We like to talk. Um, but, um, and also just be willing to do both the immediate, which is where your heart is, and balance that with the longer term recovery, which is what's going to get us out of this, so your mind and your head. Um, and I'll say that I, I have watched over the past 20 years of doing this work um, as my clients have started to integrate doing good into every part of their lives, um, not just in terms of philanthropy. And so I think that going forward, uh, we're going to see more and more opportunities for social impact in every type of financial situation that you can imagine, it's gonna be very mainstream, it's gonna be very transparent, it's gonna be very easy to engage with at every income level, at every wealth level. So I am actually very optimistic going forward about our ability to fund whatever needs to be funded in ways that every type of uh, giver and investor is comfortable with. Great, thank you so much. And you know, as I realized, this is my, you know, I, my Zoom fail. I saw two questions that came in from Jill Johnson um, that talked about, uh, given the relationship between access to capital for businesses and wealth, are any of you involved in efforts to address the void in friends and family dollars and angel capital for entrepreneurs of color? Um, briefly, I would say that absolutely this is an issue. You know, friends and family in and of itself is a privilege when you're talking about raising dollars. Um, I know, and I'll just say this briefly, for Black Girl Ventures, what they say is that whenever they have a pitch competition, they based it off of the Harlem rent parties where uh, communities used to come together when they couldn't make rent. And so everybody that attends actually is asked to put in money, no matter what the dollar amount is. And at the end of the pitch competition, they aggregate those dollars and uh, it goes to the winner of the competition. Um, since that has started, they've gotten additional sponsors. So that dollar amount has increased, but there absolutely is a place where friends and family is not something that's available to uh, all clients. And uh, I know we're at time, but Amari, if you wouldn't mind briefly touching on what that might look like you know, for the Latinx community. Absolutely. And that's exactly the void that the Power Up Fund was uh, meant to create. Before COVID, we were trying to solve for this gap of dollars. Um, <clears throat> and so right now, you can invest in the Power Up Fund. And we've had Tiburon Tanks, which is our version of Shark Tanks. And the um, the entrepreneurs that have been on Tiburon Tank are getting picked up like at Techstars and at LA Latitude and others, and they're getting uh, visibility and they're getting other like 
$25,000 from HIP has leveraged $250,000 for these other companies. So it's just getting started. And, and uh, we're out there. There's lots of them. Um, we just need help um, in getting them over that finish line. Great. Well, listen, I wish we had more time and we could continue, but we, uh, we are at time. I really want to thank all the panelists uh, for doing this. It was an honor to get to hear from you and to hear about the amazing work that you are doing. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, that information will be shared in the uh, follow-up email. And um, that's going to be it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank, Thank you very you much. This was great. Thank you. Yeah. This was fun and great. important. Mm -hmm.